Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you had a wonderful uh, weekend. I appreciate you being on here on Martin Luther King's uh, uh, birthday. I know a lot of the markets are closed, so I appreciate you putting in the effort to, to show up today. Um, last week's 5Q date breakdown, here's a great example of doing the 21, but done in a way it doesn't work. So not only can you just, do you have to just do a 21, but you have to do it the right way. And so when they did the 21 and they did, they covered all the topics, what do you think that they did wrong? What do you think they did wrong? Because I have guys all the time do the 21 point checklist and, and it works often, but it doesn't work all the time. And they're like, I don't know, I, you know, I'm doing the 21 and it didn't work well. Uh, Nick's got it. They didn't have the client say it. No questions, right, Stephen? So they, it, you can't do the script yourself. The client has to do the script. You have to ask open-ended questions. Let the client tell themselves why they need to leave their current guy, why the guy's disrespecting them. If the client tells you over an hour and a half, hundreds of times, a couple hundred times, that their guy is disrespecting them, the guy has a motive for withholding information, what are they going to do at the end of that? Now, if you tell them that, if you tell them their guy is withholding information, if you tell them and prove to them that he's doing it because he has a motive, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Because it's still the same, it achieves the same thing, right? Yeah, they get defensive, I'd agree with that. Preach, teach, tell, sell, right, glad. See, why would we tell them something? It's preaching, teaching, telling, selling. Why? But it comes down to this, why would we tell them these things? Why would we point these things out? Ah, you're right, Daniel. We're biased. We are biased. Why? So they look at me, because I used to do the 21-point checklist when I made 50 grand. <laughs> the difference being is when I made 50 grand, I was doing the telling, selling, preaching, and teaching. So they said, yes, you're right. Our guy is taking advantage of us. Yes, you're right. He is doing these things. But you know what? You're going to do the same thing to us. So what's the point? What's the point of moving? See, they have to tell themselves. So it's not good enough to do the 200 point checklist. You have to do it with motivational interviewing where they tell themselves. So um, talking a little, about, a little bit today about Stanford University study, talking about the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset. So um, the fixed mindset is I believe that my intelligence, my personality, my character, they're all fixed. They're inherent. They're static. They're lo locked down. My, my potential was determined at birth. It does not change. I'll give you an example of that. I used to think that I could not remember people's names. So you probably, some of you have heard this story where for the first uh, five, six years that I trained guys, when you'd come out to training, I didn't know anybody's name. I'd say, hey, big guy. Hey, wild man. Hey, dude. I did not know anybody's names. And I said, yeah, I remember people's faces, but I can't remember their names. And then I said, geez, you know what? Because I'm bored. That's the way I am. I'm just wired that way. And then when I quit making excuses, after 42 years of making that same excuse that I'm hardwired that way, I can't remember people's names. Guess how long it took me to fix it? When I said, you know, I keep telling the guys to quit making excuses, and I'm making excuses myself. I better fix myself. Guess how long it took me to fix that? One meeting. At one meeting, I said, I'm going to just remember people's names, and I concentrated on names, and then I played a little 10-minute video of about two hours in, played a little 10-minute video, went back, looked at the uh, seating chart, looked at people's faces, and I locked in their names, and then I called on their names for the rest of the, the, the day and a half meeting. So the, the thing is, I convinced myself that I was fixed, that that's the way I was wired. I could not remember people's names. No, you can change. See, the growth mindset is I believe that my intelligence personality can be continuously developed. My true potential is unknown and unknowable. So the fixed mindset is avoid failure. I don't want to fail. So if I don't, if I don't do things that are hard, I can't fail. That's perfect. I don't, I don't want to have that, that, that uh, heartache of failure. I desire to look smart. I avoid challenges because that might make me fail and it might make me look stupid. So I better not, I don't want to look stupid. So I better avoid challenges. I stick to what I know. I don't want, I, I look at feedback and criticism as if it's personal about people attacking me, not people trying to help me get better, but instead people attacking me. They don't change or improve. Fixed mindset. Growth mindset is, hey, desire continuous learning, con uh, confront uncertainties, embrace challenges, not afraid to fail, put lots of effort to learn. Feedback is about current capabilities, about the view feedback is, hey, this is going to help me get better. And it's obvious, who do you think, who do you think makes all the money in the world? The fixed mindset or the growth mindset?
Got one growth. Come on, guys, gals. Who's gonna be, who makes all the money? The fixed mindset or the growth mindset? Yeah, the growth mindset. So here's a way to determine whether the, this is a quiz that Stanford came up with. It's simply four questions to determine whether you're a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. So answer these thing, questions as uh, uh, true. true uh, which one of these are true? You believe your ability to sell is part of who you are and not something you can change. Is that true? Is, do you believe that's true? Number two, no matter how good you are at sales, you can always improve. Is that true? Number three, you can learn new selling strategies, but you can't change much about your ability to influence others because that's hardwired. Number four, selling is a skill that you can develop regardless of your natural talent or ability. So you got that? Which one of these are true? One, two, three, four. Which one of these did you say were true? So one and three are the fixed mindset, and two or four are the growth mindset. So if you answered two and four, it means you have a growth mindset. If you answered one and three, it means you have a fixed mindset. If it means if you answered some, um, one of these and one of these, or some of those and some of those, that means you had a mixed uh, fixed and growth um, personality. So with a growth personality, I mean, here's the way you look at it. You, you say, hey, yeah, ability does come into it. There is some ability, but the effort is far more important than the ability. I can't do it yet. So when people tell me that it's hard to do things, what does the word hard help you with? When you say something's hard, does that, does that, uh, how does that help or hurt you? If you say it's hard, guess what? It's going to be hard. Instead, you just say, hey, I can't do that yet. I'm going to do it. I just can't do it yet. That's the way we should be looking at things. I can't do it, but I, but I, uh, yet, but I will be able to do it. It's just going to take time. Don't tell yourself things are hard because they're going to be hard. Make sense? Good. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, threat. Uh, there's four risks that threaten your business. There's four risks that are uh, making your business vulnerable. And what are those threats? One is fee compression. Two is changing how you sell. Three is loss of assets when clients die. And four is not having a succession plan. These are the four things that are, are, are uh, threatening your business. So let's talk about how we can address all those things. Let's talk about how we can put a moat around your business. So fee compression, this is pretty interesting. Um, um, Merrill Lynch has a 1.3, Ameriprise has a 1.34. These are the average advisory fees. Uh, percentage is broken down by company. Ameritrade for the, now, um, so the independents tend to charge more or less than the brokers. Independent RAs tend to charge more or less than the brokers. Yeah, more. This surprised me. This surprised me. Uh, Wells Fargo 121, Morgan Stanley, Charles Schwab, E Trade. That was uh, that, that's less than Ameritrade. Um, UBS, Fidelity, Scott Trade, uh, uh, USAA. Now, these are the average, okay? And again, based on how much money you have would depend on what, uh, uh, what the averages are. But what's happening to these fees? Because these numbers are old. I think this is about a three-year-old uh, data right here. So what's happening to fees? They're going down. This is a 2000, oops, 2018, right? So with the launch of its new mobile private, uh, platform, J.P. Morgan Chase became the most recent entrant in this investment uh, world's battle to offer the lowest fees. The investing service called U Invest comes with no investment minimum and gives users 100 commission free stock and exchange traded fund trades in a year. Uh, that comes after Fidelity now has mutual funds with a zero expense ratio. An online first trade announced that it will offer free trading in all stocks, ETFs, and options. The broker terms goal is to attract new customers so guys, what's happening to fees? Going down, down, down. And why is that so important? Well, if you have $50 million of AUM at 1%, $500,000 worth of revenue, right? Well, if you're, if you're forced to go down just to 0.75, it doesn't seem like that much, but it means that your revenue went from 500,000 to 375. That means, and, and does, does this cost, when you charge 0.75, does it cost you the same, or is it, cost, is it cheaper to manage? 
it's the same. So you need to bring on an additional 16 million just to stay even. So if your uh, fees are compressed just a little bit, just a quarter of a percent, that means you're gonna have to add an additional $16 million just to stay even. So we need to be addressing this, uh, these things. And how you address it is with value versus price. So the solution is this. If all you're gonna do is provide information, you're gonna have to be, what kind of fees are you gonna have to charge? All you're doing is providing information, what's your fees? Cheap. That's why, um, you know, that's why when you use the uh, 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 Vanguard or Ameritrade without an advisor or E-Trade or whoever without an advisor, they're not, all they're giving people is information and because of that, they can charge cheap uh, uh, fees. Now, we can also help them implement and that's where most advisors are. So give them information, they help the people implement on that information. But even so, is that on the expensive start or the, where you can charge higher fees or lower fees of that pyramid? It's on the lower fees. Now transformational, guys, if all you do as an advisor is move from somebody from one investment to another investment that's slightly, slightly better, is that transformational? No, it's not. What do we do that's tra transformational? What is people, what advisors with 5Q do that's transformational? Yeah, we do both, that's right, Till. We do both the financial and the non-financial, the value added, glad, of the 21. We address things that nobody else has addressed. Also, do people understand what they have the same or much more after we're done with them? A little more or a lot more? So it's transformational in that we're covering both financial and non-financial, and it's transformational in that for the first time in their lives, guys, have you ever had a spouse? I just had two advisors tell me last week that they were just amazed that the spouse sat forward and said, I knew it for once. This is something that I care about, and I knew things weren't doing right. And I, See, that's transformational when you have a spouse say, for once, I get it. For once, you're talking about something that I'm interested in. For once, we're addressing things that really need to be uh, address. So that's transformational. Also, done for you moves it up. Most importantly, done with you. Guys, do we do things um, uh, do we do things with the client? Isn't that what motivational interviewing is all about? Is helping them understand we're, we're working as a team together to help them understand, to help them do what they need to do. So because of all those things, guess what we can do? What does that protect? Because we're doing all these things, what does that protect? Our ability to do or charge more, exactly. Our ability to charge more. You know, and, and Jeff, uh, are you on? Jeffrey. Yep, I'm here. Yep, I'm here. What do you always tell people about, you know, the DOL didn't come to fruition, but it, regulatory, you know, the regulations, the regulatory community is going to be constantly coming at us, coming at us, coming at us. How does the 5Q process uh, protect us uh, uh, from, from, you know, being judged by a, a, in the court of law ab about doing things uh, that are not fiduciary. Yeah, the fiduciary standard says you have to put the client's best interest ahead of your own. So that's kind of vague. So is there some way that we could make that tangible? Yeah, we could give them something more than a product. If all you do is meet with people and they look in the file and see that you sold them stuff, even if you sold them different stuff, uh, each client has a little bit different mix of stuff. They're just saying it still looks like you're selling things to make money. Um, if they look in the file and they see that you've sold them things, but you've also got this list of other things that you did, it looks like your selling is just part of your holistic approach. And it wasn't one of the solutions that they came up with when they were talking to DOL is that you should show them three different products. Is that really yeah, that? Is that that's, really a fiduciary that, responsibility? Yeah, that, and that's not what the regulators say. That's what FMOs are saying. FMOs are saying, oh, there's an easy way around this. Show them three products. But that's not the DOL saying, oh, well, if you do that, then you won't be, you won't be called into court. No, that's the FMO saying that. And I'm, I'm sure that if you showed them three products, the only thing the judge is going to ask, well, do you get paid on all three of these? <laughs> 
<laughs> so how is that fiduciary? I mean, if, if you were really showing them three products, one of them better be what? If you thought that showing products would get you out of a regulatory problems, one of them better be that the one where you don't get paid. Because are there products out there that, that are good for clients where you don't get paid? Heck yeah. So we don't, we don't, so Jeff, well, how do we get around that whole three product thing with the 5Q system? Well, if they look in your file, they're going to see, oh, you, you helped them with their power of attorney and you don't get paid for that. You gave them a survivor's guide and you don't get paid for that. You helped them electronically file their medical power of attorney and you didn't get paid for that. I mean, it, it, it becomes, it, it's a tangible thing that they can look at and say, oh, well, he's doing way more than just offering products. So th our whole process designed to give them more value, which allows you to charge more if you so choose and to protect you uh, on a, a regulatory uh, uh, basis. So the, uh, that's the first thing. So are, are we helping you with fee compression with 5Q? Give me a, a Y's for yeses or N's for no's. Super. Now, you got to change how you sell in a good way. In a good way, it doesn't work anymore. With, uh, and what I mean by that is selling the way we used to sell does not work anymore. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing because the way we used to sell is we used to uh, just pitch products. We used to give presentations and, and want the people to trust us. And that's a dangerous thing for our industry. Why is that a dangerous uh, thing for our industry? If all we do is pitch products, if all of us and our competitors pitch products and expect the, the client to trust us, why is that dangerous for our business, for our industry? Because it, are 100% of advisors decent human beings or are there shysters out there? Yeah, there's shysters out there. Not a lot, but they're out there. And so what happens when a shyster, when somebody moves forward, just because they trust the person, <laughs> where does that, they get screwed, and then where does that end up? Where does that story end up? Yeah, it ruins it for everyone, Glad, exactly, because it ends up in the paper, and then everybody believes that what about financial advisors? We're all what? Not just that a few of us are shysters, but they believe all of us are shysters. So it's bad for everybody. So I'm glad the people are becoming more distrustful. And you probably remember me talking about this. That there's a new, there's a new uh, uh, field of study called the, the language or uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that trust, we're in an, a, 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 uh, a new world order where people do not trust anybody or anything. And why is that? And I've had advisors come to me who's used to, who would say, geez, I was making five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars ten years ago, and I'm struggling to make 150 now. And I say, well, why do you think that's the case? And they'll say, oh, you know, because products, they're locked, uh, you know, the uh, cap rates are down, and, and um, you know what, um, um, interest rates are way down, and, you know, the market's way volatile, and blah, blah. they come up with all sorts of excuses about why they're not making, my commissions are down, right, till they're making all sorts of excuses why they're making less money. Now, that would be okay. That, that would be truthisms if nobody else is making six, seven, seven fifty a million. Are there guys making six, seven, eight, eight hundred a million dollars a year? Two million dollars a year. Yeah, there are. So apparently, it's not because of interest rates, cap rates, or anything else. It has to do with what? If other people are making the money, it has nothing to do with outside. Um, it has to do with the advisor. And here's why that's happening is. They were selling, when they were making this $700,000 a year, they were selling to the greatest generation. And what is the greatest generation? Uh, what's happened to the greatest generation? They're gone. Do you want to be investing any 85-year-old's money? you want to be moving an 85-year-old's money in today's world? <laughs> Would that be a regulatory nightmare? See, but the way that the greatest generation, how did they look at authority? How did the greatest generation look at authority? They trusted it. So when a guy walks in in a suit and tie, says all sorts of fancy language and says, this is what we should do, what did Jim and Martha do? Jim looked at Martha and said, what do you think, honey? I don't know. It seems to make sense. You know, he seems to be trustworthy. He's dressed in a suit. Hmm. I guess we should go ahead and move forward. And what would they do? They'd move forward. But now, <laughs> what's happened? They're gone. We can't sell them. Now it's the baby boomers. What do baby boomers think about uh, 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 authority. 
if they is trust authority. If authority tells them to do something, they say, why? I mean, they grew up in the 60s and the 70s. They do not trust authority. Also, how many commercials, whether it be via radio, TV, door knocking, in stores, on the internet, on their cell phone, how many commercials a baby boomer has been exposed to? The, according to, I've seen three different studies and I could keep looking at more, but it's anywhere between 3,000 to 5,000 marketing messages a day between all the ways that we're pounded on. So they, they've seen millions. So how, how uh, quickly can they spot any sales pitches? How quickly can they spot any sales talk? Immediately. So when, they, when you walk in the door, are they looking at you as a trusted advisor or do they already distrust you? I don't care if you're dressed in a suit, a golf shirt, or a doctor's scrubs, it doesn't matter. Whatever you're dressed in, they're looking at you. The only reason you're here is to do what? Help me or sell me? And it's really sad. It's really sad because some of the older advisors, um, uh, it never happens to a young advisor because they're part of that generation. But some of the older advisors, um, I'll talk to, will say, but you know what? I've been doing it this way for 40 years, and these people, trust me, they're here for my help. Really? Are they really there for your help, guys? They're there to get whatever they can out of you. They're there to get their questions answered. They're there to get, if they have money, guess why they're there? If they have money, are they really looking for help? No, they want to be patted on the back for how well they've done. And if you try to tell them they haven't done very well, what's a baby boom going to say? Yeah, that's right, Till. Till typed in uh, <laughs> a couple of uh, letters there, the letter F and the letter U. So that's what they're going to say if you try to tell them that they don't know what they're doing. See, we're in the age of mistrust also. Because anytime you, you know, back in the, when we used to work with the Grace Generation, where could Jim and Martha check up on us? Where could they research what we were recommending? Go to the library? How many of them bothered to do that? But how easy is it for, for baby boomers to check up on anything you recommend? That's why they say, hey, yeah, no, it makes sense, makes sense. And then they go, as soon as you leave, they Google whatever you recommended and boom. What are they, what's the internet tell them to do? What you recommended was great or what you, what you recommended was crap? The opposite. Even if you just Google the, 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 the term management fees. Now, management fees, is that a, when I, if I just type management fees, that phrase, management fees, is that negative, is that neutral, or is that positive? Management fees. That phrase, is that negative, neutral, or positive? It's not negative, guys. Management fees is negative? How is management fees negative? If I say, hey, management fees are bad, that's negative. If I say management fees, that's good, that's negative. The management fees is what kind of a statement? It's just what? It's, an, it's a, uh, a noun or basically acting as a noun. It's a statement. But if you go Google it, what's going to come up on Google? The first page of Google, if you just type in management fees, not our management fees good, not our management fees bad, just the term. Neither one of those. Just the term management fees. Guess what <laughs> comes up on the first page of Google? Negative stuff. Negative, negative, negative stuff. So the problem is, People can uh, distrust us to begin with, and then when they go to Google, their distrust is what? Validated? Or the, the internet tells them, hey, mellow out, this guy's really here to help you. Yeah, it's validated, it confirms it. So today, people have way too much information. How many experts are on your, how many financial investment experts are on your block? I was, I was out for a walk this weekend, Two guys, they were, uh, sweep, they were sweeping their driveways, and the other one was over with his dogs. And guess what they were doing? Want to guess what they were doing? Being investment geniuses. And believe me, neither one of these guys were investment geniuses. They've seen behind the curtain. Now, when, you know, when, when somebody is a shyster in Atlanta, Georgia, does it just stay in Atlanta, Georgia, or does it make the national news? If somebody takes... 15 
clients for $30 million, does it stay just in Atlanta or does that go viral? Yeah, it's still saying it goes viral, which means that what? One guy in Atlanta can screw me up in Minnesota. See, they be, they've seen behind the curtain, so they believe one guy's a bad guy, everybody's a bad guy. And boom, boomers do not want to be told what to think. The more you tell them the way it is, the more they tell you what? No, it's not. See, the, the, new, the new research has shown that with boomers, the most credible and effective sales pitches days are not sales pitches at all. They give information, not hype, and they put control in the hands of the consumer. Do we do that with 5Q and motivational interviewing? Yes, that's, that's everything. That's all that we do. The secret to the closing the sale is not to close the sale. Let the client close themselves. What Maslansky, who is like the, uh, the godfather of this whole new movement about uh, the age of mistrust, he found that in financial industry, most effective advisors rarely talk about products. Instead, they focus on trust. They talk in plain spoken language. See, if, you, if, if, if people can't understand you, if, if, with the greatest generation, if they, didn't, if they couldn't understand you, who did they blame? The greatest generation. If they couldn't understand what you were using, use fancy terms, fancy language, fast, fancy techniques. If they didn't believe, uh, if they didn't understand you, who did they believe? Yeah, they blamed themselves. Oh, I'm so stupid. Oh, I should have, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know these things. And, I'll, you know, uh, these are things I should know, but I don't. No, they blame, but who do baby boomers blame? You. If, they're con if, if, if I'm confused, guess who they blame? If I, as a baby boomer, if, I, if I'm confused, guess as a baby boomer who I blame? You. If I have to work hard to understand your message, I'm not going to listen anymore. See, these are the things that, that we're dealing with. So that's why we have to take the extra time and mutiv use motivational interviewing so they can understand, so they're not confused. In fact, what do we teach you when, if somebody is confused, what do we teach you to do immediately? If somebody can't understand you, what do we teach you to do immediately? Uh-oh, nobody's getting the answer here. You fall on the sword, apologize. Good job, guys. Awesome, awesome. Everybody's saying apologize. Yeah, we apologize. We apologize. How many other advisors out there apologize when they confuse a client, or do they jump in and say, here, let me help you. Let me help you understand, folks. Here's how it works. See, that, dudes, that, talking in the new language of motivational interviewing is, is what is, can help you close everybody. So when Man Fancy listened to high net worth people talk about their advisors, these people were saying very attentive and very responsive to my statement. He understands me. He's patient in answering my questions and listens. What, um, <laughs> what sensory organ is uh, being addressed in all of these statements? Ears, ears, ears. How, <laughs> how, how many advisors really concentrate on their ears versus their mouth? They wanna know a better pitch. What's a better way to say this? What's a better way to get, uh, what's a better way to explain this to them? What's a better way to get them convinced in my, uh, my point of view? No, 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 no. It's about interest, uh, getting them to, to explain to you and being interested in what they're saying. In fact, with the 15 minute drill, I had a very smart guy down in Texas. He makes $2 million a year, $2 million a year. And he said, you know what all these 15 minute drills are about? All these different things about aping people, uh, uh, agreeing, parroting, um, uh, uh, empowering, uh, falling on the sword, asking open-ended questions. He goes, here's what I, here's what the mindset I have. All of these skills that I work on 15 minutes a day, they're all based on getting a client to speak more. It's getting a client to talk more. Guys, when you ape somebody, when you agree, parrot, or em empower them, do they want to talk more or less? They want to talk more. When, when you apologize for when they, when they don't understand something or they're confused, do they want to talk more or less? More. When you ask open-ended versus closed-ended questions, do they want to uh, um, talk more or less? They want to talk more. When we don't over talk talk over the top of them, top of them, do they want to uh, talk more or less? They want to talk more. When we laugh at their jokes, they want to talk more or less. More. So all of the things that you'd be working on with the 15-minute drill, and is there any more important thing you could be doing for the first 15 minutes of every day than doing your 15-minute drill? Everybody answer this with a big no, 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 no. Because guess what skill, what, what sensory organ you're working on? You're working on empowering people to speak more, which will help you listen more. In the post-trust era, you either, you got to change or die. Now, you don't die immediately. Did these guys that went from $700,000 to $150,000, did they do that overnight? 
or was it a depth of a thousand cuts? The slow depth. That's right, tilt. So the, it, it, what happens is it changes so slowly, they didn't have a, a clue that what they were doing was wrong. It, it, they, it, it, their ability to make money eroded so slowly that it allowed them to blame everybody else. So this is right from a, a BD, and they asked, they, they looked at all the cases that were on in the books, and it was a lot longer than this, I just grabbed these. And they asked them, why didn't the case you're working on close? Now look at all these things. Relationship with, uh, with the current advisor, cost, can't save money, no compelling improvement, loves their current broker, hard time, pulling a plug on a current broker, didn't compel them to buy, not ready to change, and decisive. What is not mentioned in any of these reasons why the client didn't buy? Ah, Nick's got it. Nick's the only one that got it so far. And Michael got it. Good job, Michael. Awesome. Paul's got it. None of these say it's my fault. What are all these? What are all these guys? Starts with an E. What are all these things? Starts with an E. Excuses. Excuses, excuses. What is the real reason these people didn't buy? Do you think the advisors, guys, do we all have things that people want? Do we all have things that people want? I hope so. If you don't, you better find something that they want. So if, if, if we have things they want, the only thing standing between them and what they want is who? Us. Us, us, us. So what these guys is they pitched and they told and they sold and they preached and they teached. So what happened is when they did that, people said what? See, motivational, or not motivational interviewing, behavioral science is this, says this. If, if a decision is complicated at all, what will people do? If a decision is complicated at all, what will people do? Nothing. That's right. You guys got it perfectly. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Nothing. Everybody's saying nothing. So that's right. They'll do nothing. So leaving their current advisor, even if you try to prove to them that what their advisor is doing is wrong, is leaving their advisor complicated. Yes. So what are they going to do if it's complicated? Do nothing. So the only way that's going to get them to move is what? You don't say anything. They convince themselves they need to move. See, if I convince myself to move, is it complicated? If I want to buy even a house, if I walk into a house and I love the house, is that a complicated decision for me? If I love the house, is that a complicated decision for me? No. So how quickly will I pull the trigger on that? Chop, chop. Now, if somebody tries to convince me that buying a house uh, for investment purposes, is that complicated? And they show me, well, here's the money, and here's how you can, here's how you can make money, and here's, the, here's how you avoid the risk, and here you are. That's complicated. So what will I do? Mm, nothing. See, if they convince themselves, it's easy. It's not complicated. If you convince them, it becomes complicated because they don't know whether – how long have they known you versus the current advisor? Barely at all, right? Not long. So even if you do a great job of convincing them, they're still thinking, what? Hmm. Yeah, he seems to be telling the truth, but I've known Bob a long time. Huh. Should I trust Bob, who I've known a long time and I always liked, or this new guy who's, trying, who's proving to me that he's done wrong? <laughs> Maybe I should, uh, ah, screwed. I don't even know what to do. If I don't know what to do, guess what I'm going to do? Nothing. That's why we have to walk them through where they convince themselves. See, what we want to do is look at this. Not how many people can I sell that are referrals. Heck, you should sell everybody's referral. I want to know if a bus pulls up with a bunch of uh, uh, retired people and none of them have any intention of moving their money to me, what's my closing ratio with, with that? And what if you do motivational interviewing, you follow the 5Q process, what should your closing ratio be with a bus load of, of, of People who are retired, they, when they get off, they have no intention whatsoever of moving to you. They're all tire kickers and plate lickers. What should our closing ratio be? All that I want, right. 
if, if I don't want that five or ten percent of people who are would be horrible clients because they'd be a pain in the behind but instead I want to close everybody that I want and you could close anybody you want to see the, the power of this stuff is it turns turds into gold if you follow motivational interviewing if you resist the urge to tell them what to do avoid telling directing or convincing your, them about the, the right path if you understand their motivation seek to understand their values their needs their abilities and we do that through what how do we how do we understand how do we uh, uh, hear or talk, oh, I just gave it to you we listen to them we listen with empathy seek to understand their values we empower them work with your friends to achieve uh, uh, goals to, uh, to identify techniques to overcome barriers we empower them these are all have to do with what listening guiding facilitating it has to do with open-ended questions that's right Kevin not about telling selling preaching and teaching so that's the second thing so do we help you with uh, uh, we've got to change we got to change the way we sell so we've, have we helped you with fees with 5q have we helped you with how to change a sell yes now let's talk about don't let your <clears throat> book die with your clients so here's the problem that happens 80% of women leave their advisors when they lose their husband. And women in the United States control $14 trillion in assets. More than half the country's personal wealth is now owned by women. It's, that's expected to grow again, 22, uh, 22 um, uh, trillion by 2020. And in fact, 90% will have, uh, of women will make, uh, have to make financial decisions alone at some point in their lives as the outline. But 80% of widows switch financial advisors within a year of their husband's death. Why? Why? Well, let's see. <laughs> Here's the re some reasons that they uh, oh, in the interview they told them. I hardly knew him. He spoke mostly to my husband. How do we avoid that with 5Q? Half of what we talk about is what? We include the woman. That's right. Half of them, the non-financial stuff speaks right to what she's concerned about. The financial stuff uh, concerns what he's uh, concerned with. So we talked to both of them. He treated me like I was an extension of my husband. I just couldn't relate to him. All he spoke about was rates of return. Guys, does that sound familiar? He didn't really listen to me and I felt patronized when I asked questions. He assumed that the account would stay with him. I found that offensive. Female clients want advisors to take the time to understand and listen to them. What's the whole 5Q system about? So, what's your plan? What's your plan? for uh, when people, uh, 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 when your client dies. To hang on to boomers' assets, advisors must court the kids. So not only must you court the widow, but our 5Q system does a great job of that. So we don't have to worry about it. If you do the 5Q system, you're great. You know, the, the wife is gonna stay with you. She loves you. But now what about the kids? Our 5Q system isn't necessarily designed to get the kids involved, but there are some techniques that you can use to do that. So to hang on to boomers assets, advisors must court the kids. Baby boomers live longer than previous generations, so healthcare costs, living expenses may not eat into potential inheritance passed down to millennials. Young investors typically fire their parents and financial advisors after inheriting their assets. Most advisors haven't devised a plan for courting clients' children. Much has been made of the massive generational transfer from baby boomers to their millennial Gen, Gen Z children. Uh, so guys, this is a huge thing that's happening and kids don't keep, you know, because what do kids think? What do the Gen Z and Gen Xers think when they get the money? Does she continue to work with you? What do they do? Yep, they're smarter than us. They'll spend it or they think they're smarter with us and what are they going to do? Hire an advisor or do it themselves? They're online all the time and what is the li online telling them? They should go find an advisor? You have to buy Bitcoin, exactly. So they, they should just do it themselves. So what's your plan for the children? Conserve those kids. Here's some things you should think about. Start strengthening relationships with the spouse and families, beginning with your oldest clients. So some of these things you should be starting with your oldest clients, obviously, because they're the, they're the ones that are likely to, to, to reach the pearly gates first. So start strengthening those relationships with spouse and families. Make sure to include all assets, include assets like life insurance and annuities in clients' portfolios. So the fact that we have half the money in FIAs, why does that help you with a, with a uh, child, with the children? Why does that help you with the children? 
Well, let me ask you this. Why do I recommend that you feed at seminars? Because getting people in with no food and getting people in with food, we, we had no problem getting people in without food, and we have no problem getting people in with food. Why do we recommend that you feed them? To slow them down. It gives us a chance to talk to them and make the appointments. So why is it great that we have annuities? 50% of the money is in annuities. It slows the process down. It gives us a chance to create a relationship with them as that money is moving. So it's a good thing to have. Identify all the beneficiaries included in, and include them in your DRIP program. Guys, should we know all of the beneficiaries with our process? Yes. How much more would it cost to send them the newsletters? Six dollars a year. Six is is it six dollars a year worth it to keep your <laughs> uh, you know if, if six dollars a year for your the, to keep your clients' monies once the kids come on for the rest of their lives. If if that cost is too much, I mean that means your client is too small. You should get rid of the client anyways. Six dollars a year is not too much to add the, the beneficiaries, especially which which uh, um, beneficiary for your sure do you want to be on the drip? What beneficiary for sure do you want to be on the drip? And not necessarily a beneficiary. What child or person do you want to make sure is on the drip? Well, yeah, the wife, yes, obviously glad. We're going to send the the, the newsletter to our client, both the husband and the wife. But aha, Mark's got it. Nick's got it. Uh, uh, Jeannie's got it. Good job, you guys. The, the executor or the trustee or the person named as power of attorney, that's the person you want to make sure that you are creating a relationship with. Not that we don't want a relationship with all the kids, but the person who's going to be handling the money at the end, that's, what the, that's the person we for sure should be creating a relationship with. The trustee, the executor, or the, the person that's on the power of attorney. Make sure you're including them in the drip. Make sure you're including them in client appreciation events. And make sure that you're helping them with the non-financial items. Do non do a 21 light for those folks. Do a 21 lights for those folks. Get their, your clients setting up accounts to gift to children and grandkids. This is another technique. Get, why, why would this help you? Getting your clients to set up accounts, you know, UGMAs or um, 529 plan. I mean, why, why would that help keep your kids? Yeah, you're creating relationships with them. Also, do you think your kids are happy that you're helping uh, grandpa and grandma start giving money to help pay for the? Because of every dollar that grandpa and grandma give, does what for for them? It means they have to pay less. So, guys, do you think it's worthwhile doing these things to keep? You know, pick out the clients that you would absolutely be sad if if those that those assets left. Start doing these things with the, at least, if not all the children, at least the executor, the power attorney other than the spouse, and the trustee other than the spouse. Does that make sense? Is, is this a good idea to do, guys? Yays or nays? So don't, so don't just think it. What should you do right now? Can you all take out a, 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 a slip of paper right now and write down, I need, to start con I need a plan to start conserving those kids, okay? So does the company have a leadership? Now, the last one is this. So we, have we helped you then with uh, conserving fees? Have we helped you then with selling differently to the new people, the boomers? Have we helped you then conserve the money before uh, either the spouse or the children take it away from you when the client dies? So the last, the fourth one was this. Does the company have a leadership succession plan in place? What happens, what happens um, when you die. So work is the basis of living. I'll never retire. A man will rust out quicker than he'll wear out. Most guys tell me, and I think it's genius, that they'll never retire. Because there's, there's <laughs> I have guys who are 75 years old working one, you know, working three months a year, and they're making $150,000, $200,000 a year. They're having a ball. So a lot of guys don't want to retire. But even if, if you – so, and those are the guys that I'm worried about with the succession plan. Because guys that want to sell their business, they have a succession plan. They, they, you can disregard this part of the call because you already have a succession plan. I'm talking to the guys who plan never to retire. 
you still need a succession plan. Why? Why is that important? Even if you don't plan on retiring, has a client ever asked you, what if something happens to you? Clients used to ask me this all the time. What if something happens to you? They start, and if, they, if you don't have a great answer for them, guess what they're going to start to do? Make their own succession plan. See, they start, when, they, when they start making their own succession plan, if people aren't, people aren't confident that you have a succession plan, they're going to make their own. And if they, or uh, if they're a new client, if you don't have a great succession plan, they're not going to give you the money. So that's going to impede on your growth. So what do we tell them? With 5Q, here's, here's what I tell them. I say, I say, well, first of all, my plan is this. By every year, when we get together every year, we make sure you're in the best place possible. The best place possible. And the reason we do that, I mean, that's for every, all the non-financial things from the, from the survivor's guide, all the way up to paying the least amount of fees and getting the most value for it. We cover all those things. So if I was ever run over by a bus, first of all, this plan could coast. This plan could coast for three, four, five years, which is going to give you plenty of time to do what? Find somebody else. Also, I work with a network of 150 other advisors that treat their clients the exact same way that I treat them, use the exact same uh, uh, process and protocol that I use with my clients. And when I pass away, uh, you'll have the opportunity to work with one of those advisors if you so wish. And what does that do for folks? Does that answer my succession plan? Good. So when they go to the pearly gates, now, I'm sorry. So that, that, does that, that's how I answered. I never had, you know, when I gave them that answer, I never had somebody not move all their assets to me because they said, oh, it makes total sense. So as long as I can find somebody who does things just like you, and I said, Missy, will set you up with that person. So whenever one of our advisors dies, we contact the spouse and ask them if they would like help. If they do, then we help them set up uh, with a, an advisor that's nearby. If they don't, well, then, you know, it is what it is. But how often do spouses not want that help, do you think? Never. And that's important because this, we all are eventually going to go to the <laughs> pearly gates, and we don't know when. The nice thing is you are you got to protect your spouse with that succession plan because if, you're, if there is a succession plan in place um, and you die, your spouse will at least get some value for all that work you put in. If instead the whole thing implodes, what does your spouse get besides the headache? Nothing. So consider these options for, for um, uh, a succession plan other than what I just gave you uh, for, for your uh, clients because you, you haven't done any of these things yet. If, if, uh, if there's... That's the script you use if you have not done anything these things yet. But I would recommend you consider these things. Bringing on a junior advisor. As you get up there in age, bring on a junior advisor. This is a great idea for a number of reasons. They can handle small cases for you. They can start to handle annual reviews so you don't have to be there. Uh, you can go on vacation, things like that. And you don't have to do the work you hate to do. So that's a great reason to bring on a junior advisor. You can also merge your practice owned by a younger advisor. So if you're in your 70s, find advisors in their 50s. Merge into, the, into their practice. So these are things that you could um, um, uh, consider doing as you move forward. So are these things going to help you build a moat around your castle, around your business? So these are the things that we want to help you do to protect your business. And that's why we uh, hammer and hammer and hammer all these things over and over and over because otherwise we forget. <laughs> and that when we forget... That means we have a chink in our armor. We don't want that chink in our armor. So when you've mastered the crib notes and motive and you keep doing your 15-minute drill, the most important 15 minutes you spend every single day, I hope today helped you re, uh, helped reemphasize that. When you do your five-minute uh, moneymaker and breakdowns, that's when you can close every client that you get in front of. And that's what we want to do in 2019. So again, thanks everybody for being on the call today. It's uh, Martin Luther King's uh, birthday. The markets are closed and you're still here making yourself better. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. You have a great rest of the day and we'll talk to you all next Monday.